Irish, the Irish and UK insurance markets. And um, we were acquired in 2015 by LexisNexis, who are a giant in the um, data enrichment game. So my, my presentation today is pretty high level. It's, it's, it's a sort of an introduction to the world of data enrichment. Um, some, I, I'm going to talk about things like data sources and, and how data is distributed in the network. Uh, so um, hopefully you find it of interest. Um, and so I, I'm going to sh start sharing my screen. Uh, okay. So um, as I say, I'm going to talk about the role of data in pricing. Uh, there's some of the examples of data enrichment that are out there and where, where this data is coming from and a little bit about the how the data gets around the market. So how are insurers accessing this data and how are they using it? And then at the end, I'll give you a brief introduction as to what I'm up to uh, in my new venture called GeoInsure. So before, before we delve into the world of data, I think it's important to understand how insurance is sold. And, um, and if you look, let's just take a, a normal house. And if a developer was going to build this house, they'd have an idea of how much it's going to cost to build it. So they get estimates from builders and the builder will go, yeah, it's going to cost 300,000. And so the developer can then work out, um, okay, I'm going to sell this house for uh, 500,000. And therefore I'm going, to, um, I'm going to make a profit. In this case, I'm gonna make a profit of 200,000. So it's really straightforward. Like you, you understand your costs, you come up with a price and then you work out your profit. But that's, 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 that's brilliant if you're a developer. Unfortunately, in the world of insurance, you don't know your costs. You have no idea uh, you're gonna sell this, this policy. You have no idea if someone's gonna have an accident in the next 12 months. You don't know if the house is going to flood. You don't know if there's going to be a typhoon coming through Dublin. Um, um, so it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, you're basically, unlike the builder who knew exactly what his costs or her costs were going to be in the insurance game, you don't know your costs. And, and that, that means that, well, how am I going to set a price? So I don't know my costs, but I still have to sell the product. So in this case, I'm going to sell this motor insurance policy for 800 euros. But I have no idea, is that a good price? Is that a bad price? If I was new to the market as a new insurer and I go, okay, I'm gonna charge 800 euros for this product. You literally have no way of you know, guessing whether this is gonna be a good piece of business or not. And, and I like to think of this as um, insurance roulette. It, it, you're basically gambling that, you know, that this piece of business I'm gonna write is going to be is going to be profitable. So the way the way insurance is working is that you're you need to be able to have some assessment of the risk, the some some assessment of how likely or the propensity for a future claim. And the only way to do that is is really through data. So having an understanding about you know this type of vehicle, what is the likelihood that these types of vehicle have these types of claims, and you build up that knowledge base of about how much it costs for this type of, of vehicle or this type of driver. So it's, it's all about, you need the data to be able to make sure Russian or insurance roulette is in your, is in your favor. So if you don't want, if, you, if you're an insurer, a new insurer in the market and you're not going to be a fortune teller, you have to have data, you have to have information. And the way I sort of split out this information, I have information about objects. So that could be the vehicle, it could be a property, it could be a home, it could be a business. So you're gonna have a whole lot of information about, about that object. And you're gonna have a whole lot of information about the subject, which in this case could be the driver of the vehicle. So how many years have they been driving? Have they got a full driving license? Are they, have, they do, have they any claims? So all that data and information. And what this is doing is it's, it's weighing up in your favor as an insurer that you're going to get the premium right so by by understanding information about the object and the asset uh, the, sorry the object and the person you'll you'll have a better chance of um making money of being, of being able to price correctly so this this concept of propensity to claim so this, this idea of trying to understand what's the likelihood of, of a claim 
Um, this is all linked to pricing. So pricing needs to be able to, to make a sort of a, 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 a value judgment as to what is the likelihood I'm going to have a claim. And what insurers do, and this is very simplified, is that really what they do is they segment their market into basically buckets. So in this case, we have our market, let's take the motor market. We, we have five buckets in this market. And at the top end, on the, the bucket on the left, into that bucket will go those um, assets and objects which are of the highest risk of claiming. And they're gonna have the highest price. And on the bucket on the right, is the lowest risk of claiming and the, the lowest premium that you're going to charge. And the way that you that you can segment your 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 um, your population into these buckets is through data and data analytics. So, th so the actuaries will take information, all sorts of information about the, the, the vehicle and they'll take all sorts of information about the driver. And then they will use that to create models that will allow you to segment your your book of business so when so um when when you get a new customer you can basically put them into one of these buckets now in reality the buckets aren't uh, exactly equal because you want more of the low claimants rather than the high claimants so so you, in general you'll find that you'll be looking to try and get more of the um, customers on the right than the, those on the customers on the left. It doesn't mean to say if you're a new insurance business that you don't want to target one of these areas and you might decide, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to target bucket three because that's the, that's the, that's my um, best chance of, of doing well in the market. So I'm going to streamline all my data processing and data analytics so I, I can pick out those customers who will be going into bucket three. But in general, the insurers will be trying to get more on the right and less on the left. But knowing whether someone is going to be on the right or the left is the sort of the valuable piece of information because then you get your pricing right. So if you can if you can price the risk correctly, then your 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 overall book is is, is going to be profitable. So if we take an example here, here we have um, a fifty year old solicitor, eight years no claims discount, clean driving license, drives a uh, four year old Toyota Corolla, petrol, no modifications. So if you if you have this information about the car and the and the driver, so using that data, um, we're going to put this guy into into the low claims bucket, principally because the actuaries have used that data to model that this type of vehicle and this type of driver will have a, a, a claims record, which means that they are a low risk, um, so th so they're going to get a lower premium. Here we have Mr. Villain. He's only twenty two. Um, zero years NCD, learner permit, driving a modified hatch that's 18 years old, um, lots of modifications. Now, Mr. Villain's not going to be going into the bucket on the right. Mr. Villain's going into the bucket on the left. So again, using that, that data, you've segmented out your, your customer and you're, you're assigning them uh, into various buckets. And the whole game of data analytics and data enrichment is all about trying to build out these buckets so that when when you get a quote in, you can you can ensure that the premium is um, reflecting the the right propensity to claim. Okay, so so to, just to summarize, to, calc to calculate the premium correctly, the insurer needs to know about the subject and the object to assess the likelihood of claim. Another way to put it is the underwriter needs to be able to assess the levels of risk associated with writing the policy. Insurance is all about understanding the level of risk, um, and and that's what data enrichment does. It helps to to understand that, that level of risk. So if I go back to our, our bucket scenario, the actuaries create models which segment the customers into groupings which predict the likelihood of loss, both in terms of severity and in, and, and in frequency. So they're interested in the severity of the claim. So how much, uh, you know, if it's a flood risk, the average flood risk claim is about 32,000 euros. So they need to understand the severity of the claim and they also need to understand how frequent it is. So a flood claim might be you know, once in five years, it could be once in a hundred years. And um, so it's important that you understand how frequent these claims are. And again, that, that information can then be used to calculate the price. Now, the good news is the rest of my, the rest of my, um, my presentation is not about the, the modeling process. I'm, I'm not a data actuary. Um, I'll leave that to others, but I'm gonna focus more on the data enrichment and what data insurers use to create these, these models. So as I say, we split our data into objects, vehicle, home, 
business and subjects, which could be driver, business owner, homeowner. Um, and then if you look at the sort of data enrichment, I'm going to simplify this into three buckets. So you've got the internal data of the insurer. So if you're an insurer, Viva or an AXA, and you've been around for a long time, you have enough heap loads of internal data. So you have lots of information about your policyholder, about uh, claims in, in that market. So you have a big advantage over the insure text in that you know uh, you have this whole history of, of information. Then we have our, our second um, category, which is third party. So, th so there is a lot of third parties who have set up and created databases, maybe not necessarily for the insurance sector, but the databases can be useful for the insurers. A good example would be like the Ordnance Survey. So they have tons of data about property and they didn't create it for insurers, but insurers can get a lot of value from those databases. Another one would be um, Experian who create credit um, scores for, for banks. And that data has a role to play in the insurance market. So third party data is great. If you're an insure tech and you don't have that history of policy and claims data, you can use third party data as a substitute um, as a way of trying to get some handle on, on reducing the, the um, being a, trying to guess the future um, by using third party data. And then the third bucket is insurance, government data and other um, agency data, which, um, uh, which agencies such as um, Flood Re in the UK, or it could be the penalty points database here in Ireland. And um, these are databases that might be set up by, by the insurance industry as a particular initiative, or they might be government, or, and we're seeing a lot more of is um, open source data. So data that's being open source from local authorities, from, from government agencies, um, and that data has, has great value within the insurance um, sector. So um, let's start off with the, with the internal data. So um, further segmenting this into quote data, policy data, and claims data. So the main way that an insurer gets data enrichment is from the customer. So in the UK, if you go on Compare the Market or um, Confuse.com, you will fill in about 70 plus questions for a motor policy. Um, it's a lot of questions. And it's a lot of questions which create a lot of data. So um, the insurers use this data, just as I've described, um, to be able to put it into the models and to come up with the price. So the, so the, the number one way that an insurer will get uh, information to price on is from you as the, as the consumer. And they get that through, through these online quote forms. That is online quote forms, about 50% of the market in the UK, for example, the other 50% comes through brokerage and affinity groups. So you could be buying your data through a local broker where you ring them up rather than necessarily filling an online form, or you might buy it through Tesco or Sainsbury's or um, in Ireland, it could be super value um, somewhere where you, where you can buy your insurance. But in general, the principle is the same. You need information about the, about the policy holder to be able to provide the quote. Um, the second pot of data is policy data. So once you once the quote's been incepted and bound, then you have a policy, and the policy will run for a certain term. So in general, it's twelve months. So the insurer during that twelve months, and they will keep a record of activity on on that policy, whether there's been any claims, and um, they'll also look at things that where is the policy located? You know, is it in the centre of London? Is it in the centre of Dublin? And they'll look to see is it is it aggregated with other policies so that they have to treat it slightly differently. So for example, let's say I'm insuring a, a skyscraper and um, I'm insuring it for, for 50 million. Um, I need to understand, is that the total loss or is there other policies within, around that, that skyscraper, around that area um, where uh, you need to um, include it as part of the policy. So policy data is important for understanding what you've written. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's what we call geolocation. So, so basically geocoding the address to get an X, Y, a lot long for that location and then mapping that, that, that policy. So that's very important, particularly in the property and, and business insurance side. And then thirdly uh, is claims data. And for those who insurers that have been 
going for some time, they'll have a whole claims history that they can use um, to be able to build up their models and work out that, yes, this type of vehicle has this type of claims record. In general, you know, if you're driving a, a speedy BMW, this is the sort of types of claims that you would have with a speedy BMW versus, versus the Toyota Corolla. So claims, claims data is very valuable. And, and there's not only do the insurers have their claims data, but there's also some industry initiatives like Insurance Link here in Ireland and in the UK, the Q database, where the claims data is aggregated and um, insurers can use that data for, for fraud and for checking um, claims to make sure that they, they um, are reporting correctly. Um, and in the UK, in some cases, using claims data for, for pricing. So uh, looking at the motor quote form, this is just some of the data and it comes back to the fact that they, the insurer needs a lot of information to be able to segment those buckets. So, you know, lots of information about the person, you know, how, you know where, where do you live? What's your occupation? Do you have a full driving license? How many years have you had that license? Um, lots of information about, the, about the, the person and then lots of information about the vehicle. And some of this vehicle data comes from other sources. So they will be using um, uh, companies like CarWeb or uh, other, other similar companies where they will get information based on the, on the um, vehicle registration. So you can put in the vehicle registration and you'll get back a lot of this, a lot of this data about the, about the vehicle. Yeah, but things like mileage, how much mileage do you do? Where do you store the vehicle? Where's the vehicle parked at night? Is it on the road? Is it in a driveway? This is all very um, information that the insurer needs to be able to get that, that pricing right. And then again, also the, the claims data, what type of claim, how many previous claims, um, what, where, where were the claims? You know, were they, were they, were they um, related to where the location of the car resides or was it, was it elsewhere? So a lot of a lot of data is is collected. Uh, not so much about the policy. So you look at the, the type of product it was, when was it incepted, when was the policy uh, due to terminate, how much premium covers. You might have excesses for for certain things where you know the first the first claim um, you may you may have to take a hit for the first three hundred euros or three hundred pounds. So so they store all this information about the policy. Um, so so that's the that's the the internal data that the insurer has. So it's the, insurer, the data from the quote, the data from the policy and the data from, from claims. Now, the second part, if you remember my slide was the third party data. So insurers, uh, there's, there's a, an appetite for data and, and data is proven to be able to predict propensity to claim. And therefore um, insurers look to mop up this data and use it in their models. Um, and often they will link to another party to, to access this data. And it could be information about the building. So it could be physical information about a building. It could be perils data, for example, like does this, is, there, is the property at a flood risk location? Um, it could be information about the business. How long has it been trading? What's its, what's its um, line of business? Um, what's its credit score, i.e. does it, does it does it have many loans? Does it pay back its data well? Uh, so there's, there's a lot of third parties out there and I, I'll go through some of these third parties um, and they're all feeding data um, into the insurer's pricing engines. And then the third category was government and industry data. Um, and this is, this is data that non-insurance or possibly insurance are, are creating and they could be creating what they call contributory data. So this is where data where insurers get together and they put all their data in the same pot, and then that, that helps their business um, by sharing that information. And a good example of that is Insurance Link here in Ireland, where insurers and the members of the database they put in their database, they put in their their claims data, and the overall purpose is to try and combat um, the hundred million annual fraud bill in Ireland um, by trying to identify where um, people are putting in false claim information. But there's other, lots of other interesting sort of data that's going on here. For example, in Ireland, the, uh, the OPW, um, they're responsible for flood defences in Ireland. And a lot of money goes into protecting uh, rivers and towns and, and where people live in, in Ireland. Um, and 
insurers don't know where this where these zones are they don't know where you know the protections have been built so what the opw does is they publish uh, zones where um the works that they've done on the rivers is protecting the certain houses so they're saying look we're protecting these houses you can write your insurance cover in these areas safely because we we've, we've done the work we've invested money into protecting these areas so if you, if you didn't have this information from the government you would see oh well this property is in a very high flood risk there's no way i'm going to um, offer a premium on this um so what what the government's doing is it's sort of helping to helping the insurers to be able to write their write their business so this idea of collaboration between the government and the insurance industry is is very important um, and then that's how you you help to to sort of make sure that everybody's getting cover um, in the UK market, they have, a, they have a scheme called Flood Re, which is a sort of a reinsurance scheme. So every policy, every property policy on the home side written in the UK, um, £10 of that premium goes into a scheme called Flood Re. And if uh, what you do is it's called seeding. So you'll seed the premium that you get for a particular home property into Flood Re. So let's say it's based on the tax band of the property. So let's say it's it's a... a um, uh, a home it's in a high flood risk area and um, the insurer can see okay yeah it's it's got a high flood risk i'm going to seed it to flood re i'm going to charge an extra 200 pounds of premium and that 200 pounds of premium will go into the flood re pot and if there's a claim on that policy during my term that i have the that I have the policy out flood re will pay the flood claim not me the insurer or i i'll get my money back from from flood re so flood re's sort of built up this large pot of money which can pay out when there's a, a flood on, on any of the properties that are seeded within the flood re scheme. Uh, claims underwriting exchanges the Q database is the equivalent to insurance link for the UK market and again insurers can can access this database um, and they can use it for validation of, of motor and home claims. The third um, area uh, or in this in the sort of government um, and industry initiatives is open data. Now, open data is a treasure trove uh, for, for data that, that's been published by government and semi-state bodies. Um, in Ireland, it's data.gov.ie, and in the UK, it's data.gov.uk. And not joking, there are something like 30 to 40,000 data sets on data.gov.uk. Now, some of them are very localized, so it could be data about a given local authority um, where they've published it. Um, but there are parties out there, insure techs, um, data aggregators, who are finding this data and making it into products that the insurance industry can consume. Another great source of data in the UK market, for example, for business is the commercial or co company's house data. So this is all open source, it's all free, and it's information about businesses. So it's information about their trading, um, and it's this is public data that is available through Companies House, and it's very valuable to the insurer for understanding a business when it comes to to writing that business. Um, and I, I'll leave it to you to have a look at these websites, but uh, there there is just so much data out there. But I, I would point out that the census is another fantastic source of free data. In the Irish census, there's 1,600 fields of data about um, um, small areas, and a small area is about 40 houses in the Irish market. Uh, it's a wealth, a treasure trove of data for pricing, um, and any good data scientists and actuaries are using census data because it gives a great snapshot of what they call geodemographics. Um, so that's open data. Uh, okay, so we, we've talked about the types of data enrichment. So you've got the internal insurance data, you've got the third party data, and then you've got the government and industry open source initiative. So I'm just going to take a few examples. Uh, of, of, of some of this data. Um, and I'm going to start with, uh, I'm sorry, I've gone back one. Um, I'm going to start with uh, flood because this is an area close to my heart. Is this where we started in MapFlow in, in getting into the insurance uh, sector? And flood is one of those perils that is what I would call um, location specific. So it's quite easy to map flood risk. Um, because they, if you, you probably, you know, you've probably seen it where if you look at streets and stuff that flood, they tend to flood in the same areas 
the water tends to reside in the same areas. And it's often down to, to physical um, geography in terms of the water resides in low lying areas where the water can't escape. Uh, so these areas can be mapped and there's specialist companies in Ireland and the UK, JBA and Ambiental would be the two leaders in, in the sort of flood modeling space. And they create these, these models which um, indicate the frequency of a flood event and the severity of the flood event. So, so they basically create the models, they do all the work for the insurer and, and the map there on the left is showing these, you know, it's, a, it's basically a map showing the areas in red, those are the areas with the highest potential for flood. And then the areas where there's no color, they're, they're basically um, safe from flood. And then you can see the sort of hatched areas where that might be um, where the actual, that's where the actual river channel is. Um, so, the, so these maps, uh, they're, they're all well and good and fantastic for the flood mapping industry. But for insurers, what they needed was this sort of data to become scores. So when we were at MapFlow, what we did was we translated these models into a score related to the property. And that score can then get fed into the, into the underwriting or into the pricing engine. It can be distributed across the market relatively easy. And I'll come on to distribution at the, at, towards the end of this, but I just want to sort of point out that often you'll find with data enrichment, there's data sets that are built for a certain purpose. So in this case, it was designed for local authorities and for understanding flood risk. And then, trick is often to convert though that data set into something that insurers can use so the insurers really only want to know you know what's what's a what's the risk at this location give me a score one to ten one to thirty whatever that reflects that level of risk and then that will feed into the actuarial model and then that will affect the price that's that's quoted so you take what can be very complex science into something that's a score between one and one and ten um, and just to show you the scale of the problem in Ireland, there's about 70,000 properties that are risk from flooding. In the UK, that goes up to about 2 million properties. Um, and flood claims are expensive. You know, they can be anywhere between, you know, upwards of 30 grand. Uh, so it's, it's a problem. And, and, and with climate change, flooding is not going to be going away anytime soon. It's, it's, a, it's going to be here to stay. So uh, it's something that insurers have to, have to, have to manage. Uh, the second peril I just wanted to touch on was uh, subsidence. It's not a big issue in Ireland, but it is a big issue in the UK. Um, and subsidence is where your property is affected by, by something that's going on underground. So it could be landslip, it could be shrinkage. Um, various things can, can cause cracking uh, in, your, in your, the walls of the property, and it can be very expensive to fix. Uh, so... In the UK, you can see in the little map down the bottom, the areas in blue are where subsidence is a big issue. And it's a big issue around the southeast of England um, where there's some very expensive property. In particular, it affects um, properties that are on a horizon called Shrinkswell Clay. And it particularly affects properties where there's a large tree next to the property. Um, so, so those are all things that are mappable and can be linked to a property so that you can create a data enrichment data set that says, okay, this property has this risk of a subsidence claim. Um, so that's again, the, uh, converting science into a data enrichment uh, data set. Uh, this one is, I always think this is, after working in the industry for quite a long time, I always think that credit scores is one of those where you wouldn't think of necessarily as being related to insurance pricing. Um, credit scores are, are based on your loan history. So if you've taken out credit, uh, sorry, if you've taken out a mortgage, if you've got credit cards, um, and there's companies like Experian, TransUnion, um, Equifax, ClearScore, and they take the, the, your history, your loan history, and they model it, and they do lots of interesting things with it, and they'll basically come up with the score of whether you have a poor credit score or whether you have an excellent credit score. And this will affect things like if you're going for a loan, um, it might affect your, your ability to get a, a credit card. Um, and uh, so your credit score is, is something that's very important to you. Um, in insurance, what they do is, so not besides using credit scores for understanding whether you're going to pay all your payments or you're going to have an issue maybe paying, the, paying for the policy, um, if you have a, a poor credit score, the actuaries have proven that 
you're likely to have a higher propensity to claim. So they will check your credit score um, and see, okay, they'll put you into one of those buckets um, based on your credit score history. And credit scores have been used now for, for, for quite a long time in the insurance industry. And they haven't gone away because they are very predictive um, of claims. Um, and likewise, you can get credit scores now for um, businesses. So likewise, if your business has a bad credit score, um, it might be a concern that the business may not survive, um, you know, that you may have issues over whether it will survive the full year. Uh, vehicle data um, is, a, is an area where a lot of, most of the insurers will have access to a third party provider to give them information about the vehicle. There's HPI, there's Kazanza, there's a whole heap of car web, there's a whole heap of companies um, that provide this, this information. And it will often come from the manufacturer um, and you know we're seeing things in the UK, for example, where you get an MOT data and other data sets um, about the vehicle. And, and it's an important data enrichment data set because it takes out a lot of questions that the insurer has to ask the policyholder. So by having access to these sort of data sets, it just means that the insurer doesn't need to ask you. Um, the future uh, is connected car data. So this is where the car manufacturers are providing real-time information about the vehicle. So as you're driving, the, the car is producing data and insurers are very interested in being able to take that data and create risk scores from that, from that database. So um, your driving behavior, whether you're sharp braking, whether you're driving too fast, all this information is gonna come in the future um, about, and that will go into those risk models. So we're starting to see risk models um, moving into using real-time data. So real-time data is a, is a big new, new thing for, for these models and being able to consume that real-time data into models. Um, so it's a very interesting space. Okay, so uh, I'm now gonna talk a little bit about the data flows um, and I'm gonna talk about the personal lines market. So this is the UK market and this is how, insure, how policyholders buy their policy. Um, so they'll either go onto what we could, either can call a comparison site or an aggregator site. So compare the market, go compare, money supermarket. These are these sites allow you to type in, uh, as I say, 70 questions for motor, and they will go off and they'll come back and they'll provide a, a list of insurers and brokers and other play, players in the market and a price. Uh, and you click on the one that you like, and then it'll take you through to that insurer or broker and you, you finish out the policy. So they're, they're basically a, a sales front for the UK personal lines insurance market. And they've grown, um, you know, they've been around for quite a long time. They used to give away, you used to get a mere cash when you bought insurance or you get cinema tickets or, so they spent an awful lot of money on advertising and building a presence in the market. And it's now the main sort of way that the, the public goes to get a price they will go onto one of these sites or many of these sites and they will get a, a view as to a price in the market. And then they'll go through and they, they, will, they will bind out their policy. Now there are, um, you, you don't have to go through a comparison site or an aggregator, you can go through a direct insurer. So you, you can go into direct line group DLG or you can go into Admiral or any of these sites, they'll all have an online presence or you can go be going through broker market. So you can be going to your broker and they will be going on to um, either insurance provided um, software, or you'll see in a second where these sort of software houses which provide quote data. Um, so, so there's an awful lot, there's a large, you know, half the market is still going through brokers and, and direct insurers. And a growing area is what we call affinity. And these are not typically linked with insurers, but you can buy your insurance through John Lewis, you can buy it through Tesco, buy it through a bank. And uh, one I don't have here is it's embedded insurance. So embedded insurance is where the insurance product is actually sold with the object. So if you buy a television, it may come in the future with an insurance policy. So if it dam you know, gets damaged, then it's, it's insured. So you'll see more of this sort of embedded insurance um, where when you buy something, it, it'll have built in insurance policy. Now, um, I don't want to get into the huge complexities about this, but the, the market is driven by what they call software houses. So you have your, you have your customer facing um, aggregators and, and online tools and brokers and, and the affinities, and they all feed, their, they all get their pricing from what they call software houses. 
And in the UK market, you've got SSP, you've got CDL, OpenGI, Applied, all these players. And what they're doing is they're providing the prices. So they take the data in from, from the quote. So we mentioned about how you get the quote data. That feeds into the software house along with the data enrichment that they're getting from third parties and, and the insurers and other sources. And it goes into um, pricing engines. In the UK, they call it Polaris. It goes into your pricing engine and that spits out prices. And all of this part, the data enrichment, the software house um, pricing, the collection of the data, it's all done in sub-second. So it's, a, it's, it's an extremely efficient process um, and it's generating hundreds of millions of quotes per day in the, in the UK market. So then behind this, you've got your insurers. These are the players who, who, who are both coughing up for the claims and um, they're you know, driving the um, sale of insurance. Um, and as I say, they'll either go direct or they'll go through, they'll have broker networks, somebody like a Kavea would have a big broker network, or they're trying to go through affinity partners or they're on the aggregator sites. Someone like um, Hastings Direct drives an awful lot of their traffic, say from the, from the aggregator sites. Uh, so the insurers all have different strategies about how they're going to sell into these markets. And then finally, you've got the, these third party data providers. So there's all these third parties out there who are creating data that will feed through into the software houses um, and into those rating engines. And LexisNexis, a, a company that I was working with, they, um, are, they have sort of the glue in this network to be able to take the third party data and get it into the software houses or into the insurer pricing engines in real time. So in sub-second. So the idea is, you know, I might take a JBA flood score and I might get it into SSP and out through a um, John Lewis for a home policy. So, so there's a lot of a lot of lines between um, all these different parts of the market. And NextNexus provides all that sort of infrastructure glue to make this market, this market happen. Um, but it wouldn't happen without the, the flow of data. You know, if you didn't have this flow of data enrichment, it would be very hard for this market to, to function. And this is the Irish market. So it's the same, same principles. We don't really have the aggregators and comparison sites that you would have in the UK market. We have, we have sort of flavors of that with Chill and, and Quote Devil. Um, they, there's a lot of um, direct insurance activity in the Irish market with brokers. And then you've got affinity partners. You can buy insurance through a bank. You can buy it through super value. You can buy it through all sorts of other means. So the same, same sort of building blocks. The Irish market doesn't have the plethora of software houses that the UK market has applied would be the, the biggest player in the market. They bought a company called Relay um, who basically um, provide all the sort of the pricing engine support in the, in the Irish market. And then you have a whole myriad of insurers and you have, you know, you have third-party data providers operating in the market. And, and again, people like Lexus, Nexus being the glue, um, bringing this all, all together. Yeah, so it's the same market structure, just um, maybe with a, with a few less of the, of the players. So in summary, uh, data is key for insurers to be able to estimate the propensity to claim. That's the, that's the sort of the trick. Without the data, it's near impossible to, to be an insurer. And um, profitability is based on the actuaries being able to use that data to predict the frequency and severity of claims for different product lines. Every product line will have a different, a different um, um, probability or um, different curves and different models. Data enrichment primarily comes from three sources, your own internal data, third party data, and industry and government and open source initiatives. The whole data distribution piece is very complex um, and it, the personalized insurance market is very delicately balanced on the data enrichment flowing into the market in real time. So it's very important, the systems and everything in, this, in the market is very important for it to function. Okay, I'm just gonna finish off um, just a little bit about what uh, GeoInsure and what I'm trying to, to do. And you, you know, we've described how in the market you've got, in the UK, for example, you've got the comparison sites, you have 70 questions or more that you have to fill in. Then you've got the insurer's data, third-party data, and the government data they're all used to come up with your price. Um, so that's how the market sort of works today. And what GeoInsure is looking to do is replace all that question set piece. So we're looking to see, okay, let's not do the 70 questions anymore. Can we use our, the customer use their smartphone to take pictures of their car, video of their car or documents, or maybe take a, um, 
a video of, of a property, their pub or you know business. And instead of filling in the questions, quote video, which is the name of the product, will extract out data from the images captured. And that is basically the 70 questions that are filled in. So we extract out the data from the imagery and, and, and photos and stuff that have been collected by, the, by the, the customer. And then that goes into the pro same process as before. So you still have all your third-party data, the insurer data, the government data. So we're, we're replacing the need to answer the 70 odd questions by using video and photography. The same goes for, for property. So, you know, insurers need to understand risks in the, in the business. So, you know, is there a steep stairs in a pub down to the bathroom? Is there slip mats at the front door? All this sort of information. And so the consumer can take photographs and video of their premises and that information it replaces the need to, to send someone there on site. Um, and then that data can feed through, um, you know, with the third party data into the pricing model and you come up with your, your, your premium. So uh, many thanks. I'm not sure what, but, uh, yeah, okay. So I'll probably run over a little bit, um, but uh, I hope you found that interesting and uh, useful. And um, if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to, happy to answer. Thanks for that, Jonathan. Uh, very interesting and informative uh, masterclass. Uh, thanks for your time on that. We really appreciate it. We have a number of apologies there this morning due to calendar conflicts. I think Thursday 11 seems to be a, a, a hotting up this time of the year. So, And a, a number of requests were received to record the session, which thanks, Jonathan, you kindly agreed to, to allow that. A um, couple of questions in there, Jonathan, just on how is AI being used by insurers? How is it being used effectively, I suppose, is, is looking at there? Yeah, so um, I think that AI. So one of, one of the interesting areas, I don't know whether uh, there's a company called Tractable, which I think is very interesting. And they're using AI to where someone takes a photograph of a damaged car. So let's say you, you've had an accident. You take a picture of the, of the car and the, of where the, where the um, damage is done. You might also take a photograph of the other person's car. Uh, and then Tractable will use AI to compare the damage to an undamaged vehicle and they can work out the cost to repair. So they can make a very quick estimate and say, okay, well, that damage is probably going to be about a thousand euros. And what that does is it speeds up the whole claims assessment process. So the biggest cost in claims is all the time spent trying to work out how much the claim is going to be, you know, how much they have to pay out and all that research and visiting side. And it's a terrible waste of money. So um, what companies like Tractable are trying to do is they're trying to reduce that cost and use technology and AI. So, so, so AI is definitely making inroads into the, um, into the claim space. In, in, the, in the sort of um, administrator of documents, it's very interesting that you're starting to see uh, chatbots now being used yeah. um, principally to help customers get through claims or get through policy changes and renewals. So a lot of interest in can chatbots sort of help people through answering questions and, and processes. Um, and in, the, in my quote video, um, we're using chatbots to help the, the consumer to take pictures of, uh, to get, take the right pictures. So the chatbot will say, take a picture of the front of the building, take a picture of the, the damage of the car, whatever, whatever it might be. So, so I think AI and, uh, and it's going to become more and more part of your interaction with, with insurers. Um, and hopefully done in a nice way where you, you, the chatbot isn't turning you off. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think you'll find it, it will get better. There's things called conversational chatbots now, which are getting very good at understanding conversation um, and not just giving you back the wrong answer. Um, so, so I think, yeah, I think, I think AI, AI has a, certainly a lot of money and interest going into AI in lots of different industries. And insurance is always paddy last in these things. So I select that we'll learn from, from others. So I don't know whether you've used like Revolut. Yeah, uh, you can onboard now a banking get a get a on Revolut with just a passport and so your quick. picture your face and that's enough none of this utility bills and queuing up for 20 know. minutes in the bank and getting yeah there. like it, it, there's definitely yeah. definitely i think you'll you'll see the onboarding process in insurance getting better i mean it yeah. has to actually you're right though they are it is that slowness to adopt they are i think that, that realization has hit home you know first it hits home in the banking sector and then carries over then people see it in the insurance world that's definitely the case um, there's, about, there's about 800 insure techs who are 
looking at AI and and trying to do so. So it's it's a lot of lots going to come out of that. Um, so I think it'll, it'll definitely it's definitely an, an area where insurers are very interested. Definitely. And Michelle there has asked a question: What data is available on climate change, and do you think we're likely to continue to see more flooding due to climate change? Then, generally. Uh, yeah. So absolutely. I think. I think. Um, so. The, so. So flood data. So you got. You got what they call the. They got these models that the JB, JBAs and and the ambientals build, and they're they're prediction models. So they use science. They use amount of rainfall, terrain data, what's the surface, all this information, and they predict flood. Um, and that's that's useful where you get a prediction of flood. But now you're starting to see uh, real time information coming through. So you're starting to see. Uh, like you know the the path of the hurricane or um insurers can actually model out and see okay if this storm happens on friday evening and this is the path of the storm these are the likely claims that we're going to have and they can then sort of prepare for it so they can maybe have their call center operations desk ready for the for the calls coming through and as the, as the storm changes direction all that can be modeled and, and it can be shown that, you know, so in near in real time, they can basically work out who's going to be impacted by the storm. And they can then can start to plan, okay, well, we need to have, we need to have people on the ground that are going to be able to help these customers. And so, so I think so real time data is very important. So you've got your JBAs and ambientals who are doing the predictive sort of, uh, you know, what's the likelihood of a, of, a, of a storm happening. And then you've got this real time information that comes through from, from the weather, the weather, whether it's Met Aaron or wherever the weather data is coming from. Um, and, and also, I think it's also important, I sort of tried to stress it in the, in the presentation that the data that public authorities have and stuff about, you know, um, what defenses they put in place, um, you know, is, there, is this bridge known for shopping trolleys being dumped over it? And th there's, there's lots of other sources of data that can help um, in, in trying to sort of manage manage that risk and, and, and another area that's that's growing and will grow with climate change is actually protecting your property so you can buy all these Flood doors defenses. and yeah. windows and things that are that are basically protective against flood there's a mate of mine and he he had a flood that was up to um over the letterbox on the door and he was inside the house and yeah. the water was all around the house and, and he was able to be inside it was perfectly dry um, and he couldn't get out. <laughs> this is only you have, to go, you have to go out through a window because the, the water level was so high. So I think that that whole property level protection is very interesting. And you know, there's going to be a lot of government grants and, and stuff to try and make. Yes. I, know, I know we had we had recent discussions there with um, actually with representatives of the Department of Finance, but they're having that whole issue around flood cover in parts of the country. But even locally in Wexford, they've, they've done a lot of spent a lot of money over the last 20, 25 years on flood defences. And the areas that did flood don't flood anymore, but they still the insurers are refusing to put flood cover, even though you know, we've had a few bad events in the last 20 years and those places haven't flooded. But getting that, I think the likes of what you're doing there with you, sure, very interesting in terms of providing that data for somebody to come into that space and say, well, actually, no, these remedial works have worked. We can see now that, or even as you said, the flood defense systems, we can either give some element of flood cover or a reduced element of flood cover or some element of disaster cover that, that can maybe, because if not, you leave those policyholders totally exposed yeah. to that sort of event, you know? And I think in, in time, I mean, they're already starting to talk about that uh, people will have to move. So in, in the UK, along some of the coastline where the coast the is being eroded, yeah, yeah. You, they're just going to have to move. You, you can defend as much as you like, but if the cliff goes, you go. So so I think, I think yeah, I think, you know, that, that there may be, if it, if it really <laughs> starts to get bad, um, building massive dams outside of, of cities and stuff, it, it's 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 uh it's it's going to be very you know there's going to be a lot of money that's going to have to be invested you know to protect Cork Harbour. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it. No, that that's great, and and uh, thanks very much, John. And it's, it suggest anybody who's interested in in Jonathan's offering or find out more to follow him on. I mean, he's going very well there with his own initiative, and I think it's one to watch going into the future. And I wish you all the best with him. We hope to work closely with you, Jonathan. Jonathan, but uh, thanks again for your time. Really appreciate it, Damien. I think you had you wanted to wrap up there, did you? Yeah, thanks very much, Jonathan, uh, for taking the time out. That was a very informative uh, session. And it was great to see that some of the heavy lifting is going to be taken away or the laborious element of uh, data input for the prospective customers is going to be taken away. Um, you have fantastic experience there with Geo Insure and other ventures over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. So 
it's great to get that insight from you today. And thanks very much for taking your time, taking the time out uh, with us today. I've just popped in some details there on how to get in touch with us, uh, insurance at IT Carlo. We have a few more uh, masterclasses uh, coming up in the next few weeks uh, in strategic design for innovation and in SICA. So we hope to see you all again. And thanks very much for your time and have a good day. Thank you.